good to be here tonight and uh, praying that everyone has had a, a blessed Wednesday thus far. And so tonight we're going to be looking in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at uh, Psalm 100. Psalm 100, and specifically we'll be looking at uh, the topic of make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. So before we begin, we'll just uh, open up in a word of prayer, and then we will dive into this word. Let us pray. Lord, we are blessed to be here tonight. Blessed, Lord, to get this opportunity to study your word yet again. And Lord, we know that uh, you've blessed us, Lord, with so many spiritual riches in glory. Lord, we just praise you first and foremost just for saving us. Yes. We praise you, Lord, for keeping us in perfect peace as our minds are stayed on you. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that you have adopted us into your family and that we, Lord, are your children. Yes. We pray that you would fill us with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit tonight that we may understand your word and how your word applies to our lives on a daily basis. Plant your word in our heart, Lord, that it may yield obedience, the glory of your precious name. We certainly do pray, Lord, for our nation's leaders tonight, our state leaders, our local leaders, those first responders that are serving in various parts United States serving humanity. So we just praise you again tonight, Lord, for being great and greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm 100. Psalm 100, and we'll start at verse 1. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Yes. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. Yes. His loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Right. Amen. Make a joyful noise is what we're talking about tonight. But yet, beloved, what if I told you that God cares about how we worship. What if I told you that? That God cares about how we worship. Because if God cares about how we worship, it also means that we too ought to care about how we worship. Amen. And so this psalm that we're looking at tonight, Psalm 100, is a part of book number four of the Psalter. The Psalter, the book of Psalms, is the psalm book that Jesus would have utilized in his day. And so there are five books of the Psalter. We're just looking at one psalm in book number four. And so it's book number four that is about the worship that we give to our God. So I believe tonight that we all can agree that worship matters. And so this psalm calls God's people to worship our great God. 
Most importantly, our great God, because he has come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the reason worship is important is not only because our Lord cares about how we worship and we should care about how we worship, but worship is important because we should want our worship to be biblical and we should want our worship to be Christ-centered because you all know that we live in a day and time where there's this thing called what? Worship wars. You know, you got individuals who think that worship should be contemporary. You got some individuals who believe that worship should be more modern or that, what shall I say, not necessarily contemporary versus modern, but contemporary versus traditional or modern versus old, contemporary versus traditional. You got some people who come to church and there are instruments. There are some places where there are no instrumentation. There are some places where you go to worship and they sing primarily hymns. There are some places where you go to worship and it's like you done been to a rock concert, you know, on Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, it's like they got the... They got the full worship band with the guitar, the horns. They got everything. And so we can't allow what people's uh, sensibilities are or preferences are regarding worship guide how we are to worship. Because worship is both public and private. Worship is both public and private. We should be worshiping privately, and we should be worshiping publicly. And so worship is important. It's important because when it comes to worship, we have to have the right attitude about worship. Worship should not be looked upon as something as a treasury. Oh, man, I got to do that again. <laughs> Come on. I gotta, you mean tell me I got to do this again? <laughs> no, worship should be looked upon with a joyous attitude. I mean, worship is something that we should get excited about. Amen. And so it's a... It's a high privilege for us to be able to stand in the presence of our God or sit in the presence of our God and worship. It's not only a high privilege, it's a high honor for us to be able to worship our God, especially in the United States, where we are granted the freedom to be able to worship our God in ways in which some of our brothers and sisters in closed countries around the world do not have the opportunity to do. It's something to thank God for. It's something to praise God for. Because there are a lot of places around the world where they can't do what we're doing tonight. To do what we, what we are doing tonight in some places around the world may get you killed, may get you thrown in jail or prison for a long time. So for us to have the freedom to worship and gather as the body of Christ is, it's a blessing, it's a privilege, it's an honor. And so when we look at Psalm 100 that is before us tonight, when we look at this particular psalm, this psalm prescribes how God wants to be worshipped. It prescribes how God wants to be worshipped, the attitude that we are to have when we worship God. And I believe we can unpack this within the seven imperatives that are found in this psalm. Imperatives are simply commands. 
So this is not a suggestion to worship. This is a command to worship. In this small, power-packed song, just five verses. Five verses, yet it is power-packed. And we find seven imper imperatives in this song. And, and one is shout. That's in verse one. The, the second one is serve. That's in verse two. The third imperative is come. You see that? That's in verse two as well. The next one is no. No. Do you see that in verse three? No. But then, after no, you see enter, you see give, and if you got the NASB, NASB, it simply says bless. Bless or praise his name. So those seven imperatives, again, are shout, serve, come, know, enter, give, and bless. Verse 1, shout joyfully to the Lord. Verse 2, serve the Lord. Verse 2b, come before him with joyful singing. Verse 3, know that the Lord himself is God. Verse 4a, enter his gates. Verse 4b, give thanks to him. And then 4c, bless his name. And so I believe these imperatives, again, are attitudes that we ought to have when it comes to worship. And I could summarize these seven attitudes that we ought to have when it comes to worship into seven S words. Shouting. Serving. Singing. Submitting, the setting or setting, saying. The setting has to do with the gates and the courts. The saying expresses ourselves, our worship with words or saying thanks, solemnize. That is celebrating God's glorious name. But let's start with the first one, shouting. The text says in verse 1 of Psalm 100, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Or if you, if you memorize it like me, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. You know, that's, that's how I memorized it in the King James Version. But this is the NASB, so it says, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. And so making a joyful noise to the Lord ought to come with a shout. Worship is not something that's going to be quiet. Come on. You know, we just can't sit and be quiet when we are worshiping our God. The text says, shout. And the picture is of a king who's getting ready to enter in. And this king is coming in to his, his kingdom. He's getting ready to sit on his throne and He's coming back and the people are shouting. Mm. They're celebrating the king. And I want us to understand this. That there is an aversion in our culture today. On the earth today. To celebrating our king. And although there is an aversion 
to celebrating the king of the universe, that does not mean we do not have a responsibility to still celebrate or shout joyfully to our king. Look at Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, if you get the King James, the fullness thereof. This is the NASB, and it says, And all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. The earth is the Lord's. Hence, the psalmist says in Psalm 100, verse 1, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. You know, it's not just believers who owe our God worship, right? The whole entire earth owes God worship. Worship is due him. I mean, how many of us set the, the sun and the moon in its place? I mean, how many of us can make a tree? You know, only God can make a tree. And so, our God, our King, is due worship. Right. And so, we ought to shout to Him. But not only do we shout, we serve our King. Because let's look again at the text. In verse 2, it says, serve the Lord. With gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Don't you all know that uh, worship is service? Hence, we oftentimes, when we speak of going to church, when we say, I'm going to service. <laughs> I'm going to service. See, worship is service. We were created to serve our God through worship. And so worship is a time where we can be glad, even though internally we may be feeling sad. Because as we'll see, worship is not necessarily a feeling. Worship is a knowing. Mm. Worship is based upon the relationship that we have with our God. Right. So, despite the fact how we may feel in worship, there's some people who come to worship that are sick. There's some people who come to worship and they have all kinds of issues that they got going on in their life. But despite our circumstances, we come to serve our God through worship. Right. And this worship is done with gladness. Because again, all true worship is service. And so, because we are created to, to worship, we've been created to to worship. We need to understand that all human beings are going to worship something. You're going to worship something. And the question we need to ask ourselves is what are we going to worship? Because we ultimately become whatever it is we worship. We become like whatever we worship. And so, again, let me emphasize this part of service. Worship is service. Let's go to Romans. I mean, in light of everything that God has done for us, Romans chapter 12, we ought to give God everything that we got. Our entire lives 
are to be utilized as instruments of worship. And so he says in, in Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Our entire lives are to be used in service to our God as an act or instrument of worship. So what does that mean? If I'm at the grocery store, I'm, I can use that as an opportunity to serve and glorify my God. If I'm at work, I can use that as an opportunity to serve and glorify my God through worship. If I'm doing something that is recreational, I can use that particular recreational activity as a means through which my life, my life becomes an instrument of worship. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so, shall we? Serving our attitudes we ought to have when it comes to worship. And not only shouting and singing, but, but not only shouting rather and service, but singing is the third one. Is an attitude that we need to have when it comes to worship. So the shouting, serving, then singing, because when you come back to Psalm 100, verse 2, and it says, Come before him with joyful singing. You know, we sing hymns here. We have to sing the hymns joyfully. You know, we'll get down at the cross. <laughs> Where am I? Savior God. No! We sing that with enthusiasm. You know, there's people clapping down at the cross. You know, they, they're clapping. There's some people that are off key. That's okay. <laughs> God don't care about us being old key, old key. He don't care if you got a good voice, a bad voice. It's the attitude of the heart. And so we come before our God's presence with singing, joyful singing. And the reason why we sing is because we know what God has done for us. And not only what God has done for us, we know what he's able to do for us. And we know who our God is. It's, it's, it's based upon our vertical relationship, again, that we have with our God. But at the same time, we've got to be careful about what we say, you know we. Amen. Because everything is gospel music. It's not gospel music, right? <laughs> Everything that flies under the, the banner of gospel music is not necessarily gospel music. And we got to be concerned about uh, the words that we use when we sing. I mean, I, you know, some Sundays I turn on a certain radio station on our way down here and because they play gospel music up to about 11 o'clock and 
I gotta be honest with you, there's some songs that come on that station when I'm driving my way on, on, on my way down here to church and I'm like, I know that beat. <laughs> <laughs> And I know that song, and I know the song and the beat that they using. They may be throwing a little Jesus here, here, and here, but I'm like, no, nah. I don't think those particular authors had Jesus in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were thinking about Jesus. I don't think Earth, Wind, and Fire was thinking about Jesus with certain songs. <laughs> are being played today that are played in the name of, of uh, gospel music. So we got to be careful about the words because our, our gospel songs need to be laced with as psalms, hymns, and even spiritual songs. So yes, we sing, but we, we are concerned about the words we sing. We want our words to be laced with scripture as well. You, want, you know, you want to be able to fingertip it a little bit. Yeah, I heard that in the word right there. You know, yeah, yeah, I can get with that. So, shouting, serving, singing. But then, if we look at the next one, our added, the next attitude is uh, submitting. Submitting. Verse 3, it says, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Knowing, do you know who God is? No. We need to know the God that we are worshiping. We need to know Jehovah. We need to know Yahweh. God has made himself known. In Psalm 19, let's, let's go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 and we'll start at verse 1 where it says, The heavens are the telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day it pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there, are there words. The voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth. And their utterances or their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed the tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. This guy's general self-disclosure, a general revelation. We know that there's a God based upon looking at creation. But creation itself is not enough for us to know God. we got to know God through his word. Know that the Lord himself is God. So, seven, starting at verse seven, you go to nine, it talks about God's word, the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandment. The fear of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. Those are all synonyms for the word of God. So we got to know God, not just through creation. We got to know God through his word. If we go worship him, how he has prescribed for us in his word. And so, it's our God who's not only creator. It's our God, when we come back to Psalm 100, verse 3, it says, He made us. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We 
did not evolve. He made us. We did not come from some primordial slime. We didn't come from apes or monkeys. He made <laughs> us. Let's, let's go to one. Uh, Psalm. Let's go to one. 139. Let's go to verse 13 of Psalm 139. He says, For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Mm. That's deep when you think about it. God created us. He, he made us, and when God makes us, creates us, God is not through with us. Because if you come back to Psalm 100, verse 3, 100, Psalm 100, verse 3, he says, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God, the imagery here is of God being like a shepherd. David must have had this in mind when he wrote Psalm 23. Let's go to Psalm 23. Where the word of God says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. But not only did David say it, Jesus said it as well. Let's go to John chapter 10. New Testament, John chapter 2. Let's start at uh, verse 11. John chapter 10, verse 11. What does Jesus say? He says, I am. And when Jesus makes these I am statements, ego in me. I am the good shepherd. The ego in me is pointing him back as the God of the Old Testament. When Moses approached the bush that was burning, burning yet not consumed, and God begins to speak from the bush, and God says, I want you to go tell Pharaoh. Go not only tell Pharaoh, tell my people, but tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And then he said, listen, when Pharaoh asked me who sent me, he said, you tell, he said, what am I supposed to say? He said, well, you tell him I am has sent you. Here's Jesus in verse 11 of John chapter 10 saying, I am connecting him with God of the Old Testament because Jesus just didn't come into being in the New Testament. Jesus is eternal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. 
such was the same in the beginning. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. But let's come back to John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and, and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father I, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. And that don't mean Muslims and Mormons and people of other faiths. Other sheep that are not of this fold points to Gentiles. Gentiles. He says, so I have other sheep which are not of this fold, I must bring them in also. They will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This is the commandment I received from my Father. Amen. So, our God is a shepherd. He's the good shepherd. So, shouting, serving, singing, submitting. But then look at the setting. Look at the setting. Come back to 100. Psalm 100. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, told up, confession, and praise. It's the gates and the courts of the Old Testament temple. Now, in the New Testament, who's the temple of God? It's the saints. It's the redeemed. We are the temple of God. Go to 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians 3. 16. First Corinthians 3 and 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. The saints of God, we, the redeemed, are the temple. And so we gather together in this place to worship our great God each and every Lord's day. So the setting. Temple, we are the temple. We come into this place to lift up praise to our God. So we not only have the setting, but we have a, a saying, so to speak. There are words that we say when we worship. Because worship is about words. So what is it that we say? The text says in verse 4, give thanks to him. Give thanks to him. You know, somebody ever done something good for you, nice to you, you know what you're supposed to say, right? You're supposed to say thank you. That's called having good manners. And God has done so much for us and he does so much for us each and every day of our lives. The only way we can even make an attempt to acknowledge his goodness is just to simply say thank you. Amen. And we have to thank him whether we have little or whether we have plenty. Amen. We've got to thank him in our good days and we got to thank him in our bad days. 
See, the word thanks in this particular verse right here is not toda, but yada. And so yada means uh, to throw. Sometimes my wife, when I'm preaching, sometimes she kills me after service. You know, she said, baby, I was getting ready to throw, take my shoe off and throw it at you. <laughs> you know, I was great. Take my shoe off. I said, you go ahead and throw it. <laughs> <laughs> to throw. Yeah. Yes. To throw. To shoot. To, here's another word, law. You know, when uh, we have graduation ceremonies, there are some people who graduate to magna cum laude. That's great praise. There are some people who graduate summa cum laude. That's high praise or the highest praise. The highest distinction. But if you were like me, <laughs> when I graduated, you graduated, thank you, Lottie. <laughs> <laughs> you were just glad to just make it through, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So the <laughs> emphasis on that we should be in the regular habit of praising our God, thanking him not necessarily for what he's done, but who he is, mm -hmm. because worship is about giving. Wow. And we got to bring something with us when we come to worship, because when we come to worship, you're not just coming to stand in my presence. Mm -hmm. You're not just coming to stand in the usher's presence or the deacon's presence. We're coming to stand in the presence of our God. Let's get ready to close this thing down on this last one, and that is uh, solemnize. That is celebrate his name. Because in Psalm 100 again, he says, into his gates with thanksgiving and scores of praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. In other words, praise his name. Celebrate his name. Why? Because the Lord is great and he's greatly to be praised. But not only that, it's also in verse 5. Where he says, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. You know, everything about our God is good. Yeah. His love is good. Yeah. His mercy is good. His grace is good. His peace is good. His holiness is good. His providence is good. His saving power is good. His ability to be able to provide for us what we need when we need it is good. And so our good God calls us to worship him. We don't invite him in. He calls us to worship him. Right. So our God is not only good, but he, it says his loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. So our God, he's kind. He's, he's kind and he is faithful. He's, he's merciful and he's faithful. And so in short, 
God is faithful. And it even sounds good when we say it backwards. Yeah. Faithful is God. Makes sense both ways. In other words, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. God does not make a promise that he does not fulfill. Hence, we sing, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. For all that I have need of, yes, yes. Lord, you have provided it for me. So let's close with this song right here. 103. David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. He must have got good to him. O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. What's the benefits? Who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He renews us like the eagle. When it comes to the eagle, it was Isaiah who said it this way. He said, the youth may grow faint and become weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. For that God is to be praised. Amen. For that we are to make a Joyful noise. Any questions tonight? <clears throat> all right, well, God bless you all. May heaven smile upon you. Let us close in prayer. Lord, we are blessed to be here tonight. Bless, Lord, that we learn that we have a responsibility to make a joyful noise unto you. Yes. And that, Lord, it is our duty to praise you and worship you in light of who you are and what you have done for us. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue to watch over us. Continue, Lord, to help us to trust you. Continue, Lord, to help us to hold firm to your promises that are found in your word. Watch over us, Lord, as we go to our respective destinations tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.